Jules Munz is a professional improviser and co-founder and artistic director of the nursery, which as he told us has been going on for 10 years. He's also a member of the award-winning improv comedy, excuse me, improv company called The May Days. He performs regularly in improv shows in London and Brighton, tours and festivals worldwide, and teaches both performance and applied improvisation. And I first met Jules as a kind of a student um, practitioner when he was um, doing a thing at the National Training Laboratories Conference um, in the UK outside of Oxford. Talked about our different um, approaches to um, improvisation, I guess, and uh, basically just hit it off. Anyway, Jules, the floor is yours. Wow. Uh, good, <laughs> good morning, everyone. Uh, it sounds so so grandiose to <laughs> be introduced in a way like that. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm not, uh, as you know, my primary practice is in improvisation, so I'm not used to uh, speaking for extended periods of time or in a planned way. So uh, already at this point, I am way out of my normal comfort zone. I just wanted to call that out at the beginning. Wow. Um, and I should have said that before that I'm, yeah, I'm always a little nervous about describing the thing that I do, that we do, our kind of community. Um, uh, at the risk, it, it sounds very strange when you talk about it, um, and it doesn't feel anything like it looks or feel anything like it sounds when you describe it. So I'm gonna, I'm starting off with that kind of uh, caveat in terms of what I'm saying. So I'm going to give you a little introduction to um, the way that I approach improv, the things that I've learned about improv, um, what got me into it some of the ways that improv works, some of the challenges and questions in uh, sort of Western Protestant society, which is where we we are all embedded, even though we might identify as such, that's the, the context which we have. And then I'm gonna give you a couple of ideas why I think improv, uh, improvisation is so, is so important in with what is happening in the world at the moment. And then we're gonna try out some very simple exercises. I've been, um, as part of a project with the nursery, I've been experimenting with how uh, improvisation would work in using Zoom and an online platform. So I'm going to try out some of those things. And I'm going to try out some new things, which I think might work. And then we'll have a couple of chats uh, as we go through. So uh, improvise, anything can be improvised, right? You can improvise uh, a budget. You can improvise a childcare plan. You can improvise an afternoon with a friend when you didn't have a plan. Um, all it means is you don't know what's going to happen. You discover what's going to happen as you go. So... Uh, my practice of improvisation um, is the theatrical form of improvisation. So we do shows. We um, step up on stage and we might know the genre of the show. We might know the style of the show. Normally we know who's going to be in the show, but we don't have a script for it. And we make that up as we go along. Um, primarily that's associated with uh, comedy. I'll come back to the idea a bit later. Um, but I would imagine that all of you are familiar with Whose Line Is It Anyway, the television show, British and then American television show, which is coming back. Um, and that's the normal context people understand it from, but there's a huge body of work away from those games and scenes. Those games and scenes are great, and some of those performers are, I'm proud to say, are friends of mine now, but you can improvise, you can do those games and scenes and things. You can also improvise a, a play, a sketch show, uh, a musical. Uh, we had one of the shows that we did at the nursery this year was an improvised parliamentary inquiry, uh, which is kind of like a... Um, uh, what's the word, a select committee kind of thing. So that was not a huge success, but nevertheless, it was a thing which <laughs> happened. <laughs> um, so it's theatre with no script. And I, I spend my time divided between sort of three things. One is performing and directing shows. One is teaching people who are not professional improvisers, uh, doing classes and directing shows which they are in. So that's in a kind of teaching context. And the third one is in the applied improvisation context, um, which is taking the skills and exercises of improvisation and putting them into other circumstances. So some of the things um, that I deal with frequently are um, reacting quickly and calmly under pressure, uh, agility under pressure, we call that. Um, shared creativity, it's very easy for shared creativity to just be a big ego fight. Um, what we call, excusing my language, what we call a shit fire, where most of the energy in the room goes into people fighting for their own idea rather than trying to make something collectively. Um, 
improve for anxiety, improve for um, social anxiety in particular. So a wide variety of, um, of different applications of it. And for me, although it is the sort of the major income stream for the nursery and for myself, that is not the bit tacked on the side that I'd like to get rid of. It's the um, it's sort of the heart of everything that we're doing because for me, improvisation is a it's a it's a moving meditation it's a living moving meditation it's something which is about bringing you bringing you present and giving you um power to respond in the moment so when you're on stage if i spend i'm on stage with one other person doing a scene if i spend all of my time pushing my ideas forward then i'm not present with what my partner is bringing if i spend my whole time just trying to support my partner and bringing nothing myself then I'm sort of a waste of space. And to me that um, uh, being both very passive and very active at the same time, receiving and giving information in a cycle is something which is in, in to me an inherently a spiritual experience, um, but also what really uh, makes improv into something so, so beautiful. Um, the core idea of improvisation, which some of you will be familiar with, it's spread uh, widely outside of uh, a theatrical improvisation context. It's now taught at a variety of, um, what are they called? The Amer uh, Ivy League, that's the name of the big universities, right? The Ivy League universities. Taught at several Ivy League universities and a couple of universities here as well uh, is Yes And, uh, which is widely used outside it. Whether it has its origin in improv, I don't know. Very simple thing that if somebody offers me an idea, I take that idea and I add something to it myself and then I pass it back and that person adds something to it. And there's huge amounts of productivity in that simple agreement back and forward. I, I think what you're doing is great. You'll think what I, I am doing is great. And in a way, I think that's already, um, uh, what's the word? I think that's already quite a, a contentious idea um, because what that is asserting as, as a way of looking at the world is that every interaction has value. Every interaction, every piece of information that you receive is interesting, is valuable, is useful. And if you're, if you're practicing yes and, and people get very tied up in knots about the specifics of what yes and is and should be and how it operates, you are inherently supporting your partner by bringing strong ideas of your own. So there's a circularity of this, uh, of energy back and forward. And the, the lovely thing about that is it, it completely removes the possibility of mistakes. So when I start um, teaching, um, I often start by saying, you can't make mistakes in this. It's a series of experiences I'll put you, in, I'll put you through. Um, you may or may not enjoy them, you may or may not react in different ways, but you can't get them wrong. Um, and people look at me and they, they clearly don't believe me. Um, <laughs> And it takes a long while for people to be convinced that the idea of mistake just doesn't exist. And uh, I think it was Bill mentioned jazz earlier and jazz and contemporary improvisation come with some uh, big parts of American uh, jazz and improvisation came out of some of the same places in Chicago in the sort of fifties. So it's, it's jazz theater is, is how you think of it. Um, that when someone makes a mistake, if you think of it as a mistake, then, you're damaging the product but if you think of it as just something that happened then you get to respond to it you get to yes and that and Fayla McDermott who's an um, improv uh, teacher and director and uh, is the only person allowed to direct Philip Glass's operas in, in Europe um, has a wonderful phrase about this which is uh, you can argue with reality as much as you like you'll always lose which I think is a really, I don't know if that's his in origin, but that, to me, that's sort of the heart of, of improvisation. So that's a little introduction to uh, what improvisation is, is about for me. Um, I'm just going to talk about three things, which um, three challenges, which are definitely true of the UK. And I think, um, I think carry over into America as well. Obviously we have some, some, cultural differences between our countries, but also a lot of cultural similarities. Um, the first one is a hard separation between fun and work. Um, right back to, you know, Martin Luther really hammers this very high. It's in the articles that he nailed to the door in, um, I forgot the name of the, of the, of the town, uh, but this idea that we work in order to be closer to God and that we get a little bit of fun, it's a little bit of sugar in order to make the medicine go down and we should never uh, we should never try and combine those things. And I think that's such an inherently poisonous, disgusting, horrible, awful idea. I will swear about it as much as you like. Um, 
and I think a lot of that to me is around this idea of, of flow, which I'm sure many of you, several of you will have read uh, Flow, Chiksent Mahali, that, that book. The idea that um, in order to be fully engaged in a task and have full satisfaction from a task, it needs to be uh, just challenging enough to make you challenged, but not so challenging that you're terrified or anxious or experience the negative emotions that make you want to go away. So I think that, that that division of fun versus work, people often come to us to start classes because um, they want a little bit of fun at the end of the day, they want a little bit of fun at the weekend. And what they'll find is that fun bleeds out into the work that they do. It bleeds out into other contexts. And as with meditation, I also meditate. Um, after a while, you find that nothing falls outside the practice of improvisation. In the same way that nothing falls outside the practice of meditation, it's all part of the game. That fun and work thing, I think, is really uh, something we have to work with a lot. The, the, the second is this idea. Um, it's, it was funny that Angelo, when he was introducing me, um, he, he misspoke and said uh, Mayday's improv comedy, improv company. And it's such an association between improv and comedy that that's probably your unconscious mind filling in that gap and you wouldn't be the first person. Um, but again, I think in, uh, in Protestant society, in Western society, in work-obsessed society, we see humor, we see laughter as something uh, weaker, lighter, less important, uh, as something um, to be done on the side, to be brushed past, and then we can get back to the hard, real process of dealing with life. And I think that is just nonsense. Um, it's very hard to get into exactly what humor and laughter is for because they're not the same thing but they're, they're so connected um i don't want to speak for too long although i could speak about this for ages but um daniel dennett who is a wonderful wonderful writer um has a book called inside jokes which is a lovely book about that and his his theory in that book which is uh, actually i think that book is a shared authorship with a couple of other people whose names i've forgotten i'll find the link and send it out later um his theory in that book or their theory in that book um which i haven't found a better one to replace is that the the slap the snap of humor the click of appreciating humor is when your um rough heuristic of the world is corrected with new information so to give a very blunt example um let's take a, a terrible pun if you want to catch a squirrel all you have to do is climb up a tree and act like a nut right it's not a good joke but we all recognize that has the shape of a joke it is a joke um uh and the kind of joke that my dad would enjoy very much. Now, the, and the, the snap of realization is that initially when you hear like act like a nut sounds like madman, crazy person. And there's a snap of realization from context, which means where you understand, oh, you, it literally means a nut, the thing which a squirrel eats. And that little snap is where the humor operates. Um, and I think that's a very interesting uh, analysis of humor. And one of the things uh, around improvisation is that we're always... Uh, there's the laugh of a fun joke and there's also the laugh of order arising out of chaos. So three people getting up on stage, five people getting up on stage, 10 people getting up on stage and doing an improv show. It shouldn't work. It's against the rules of hard working, well thought through Protestant work ethic. And when it does work, when something does come together, there's this laughter release as we've realized that actually there is value and there's possibility in, in those kind of patterning. So humor as a, wonderful tool to realize and learn and grow about the world is, is the second thing. And the third, um, third aspect of society, which we're often in relationship to um, uh, when we're teaching improvisation, doing improvisation is the idea of um, a distrust of collective activity. Um, so uh, this may well be a person that you're familiar with, Bill, with your background, um, Barbara Ehrenreich, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, who wrote a wonderful book called Dancing in the Streets, um, which is on my list of five change your life books, um, in which she, she traces the history of collective rhythmic physical activity uh, back through rave culture, through hippie culture, through uh, medieval carnival, through um, Bacchic rites, the whole, um, and that's your kind of Western European view of it. Of course, he talks about a bunch of other um, non-Westernized, non-Christian cultures as well. And her, her contention in tracing the regularity with which this idea and this practice comes out is that it's a, a biotechnology for cooperation. Uh, so that we are not we're not the species which ended up ruling the world because we're smart. We're the species that ended up ruling the world because we can cooperate. 
And the older version of cooperation was, hey, we can all get together and hunt a mammoth or whatever kind of crude evolutionary analogy you want to make. Um, but in the, in the absence of those kind of activities, that part of our brain is still there. A part of our brain that wants to move together, that wants to work together, that wants to make rhythm together, um, and that finds a huge amount of potential and power and satisfaction in that. But we are told as a society, we're told to be individuals, be yourself, do your own thing, that repeated, you know, every advert is about expressing the individual self. And that's something which both uh, your country and my country hold very, very dearly. And it's wonderful, but it's not the whole story. So those are the three things, fun versus work, humor, having value and collective activity, um, which I think we're all often in relationship to, and which has a strong relationship to spirituality for me. Um, the last thing I'm just gonna mention is reasons why I think improvisation is so valuable now. Um, uh, one of them being very practical and one of them being sort of emotional. So I'll start with the practical one because that's less fun. Um, there was a period from the invention of the the factory and the division of the division of labor and pin manufacturing and all the the origin of a job being repeat this one simple activity over and over and over and over again until you die <laughs> on the production line you know that that picture of a job is absolutely and completely dead now and uh, the idea that jobs and activities can just be simply repeated um techniques um is anyone who holds on to that idea is, I think, uh, going to be swept away with the machines are coming for us, basically. The machines are coming for us. Um, and improvisation in relationship to that allows us to think, react, think about things the other way. Machines are incredibly do good at doing things very reliably, very repeatedly, very perfectly, but they're not good at saying what's the opposite. They're not good at breaking it and starting again. And I think as as machine learning gets stronger and stronger, um, the human contribution to, to, to the economy, uh, it gets further and further, it gets higher and higher, it gets more and more technical, it gets more and more cerebral, and if we take fun and work to be separate things, it gets more and more playful. And I think that's, if we decide to engage with it, I think that's really exciting. The other is um, uh, in terms of, uh, again, in terms of information technology, uh, Angela and I were talking yesterday about the constant barrage of notifications and information with which we are swamped you know i'm sure if I, my phone is sitting right next to me I, i'm not going to look at it but i'm sure there would be a half dozen notifications there and i've turned off as many notifications as i can find um we're bombarded with information both actively that just comes to us and also um also have a huge amount of information which is available to us passively and look to my left and one of my bookshelves and there is more information on that bookshelf i am sure than will be available in the entire lifetime of most people in most parts of human history um which is wonderful that is great i love having access to all the information <laughs> the problem is you have to decide which bits to have interaction with and I don't know if this is a phrase in the States, but um, in the UK, we talk about FOMO, fear of missing out, little initials thing. And whenever it gets harder and harder to stay fully engaged with the activity which you're doing, when you feel there's a danger that your attention would be better spent elsewhere, which the lovely thing about improv is it, it teaches you that your attention wouldn't be better spent elsewhere, that your attention is gaining value by being spent, that by sustaining your attention onto a single thing, um, you're doing something beautiful with your mind. And again, I think it's a Plato quote, um, what you do becomes what you